Welcome to the EPG Patshala lecture series for postgraduate students of architecture. The subject we are discussing is sustainable and green building design and the module we'll be delving into is basic principles of passive design. So in this lecture we'll be hoping to comprehend the methods of passive heating using solar geometry to study the process of passive cooling and shading as one of its methods to help understand the importance of daylighting in design as a primary element, to study the importance of materials in sustainable design as well as the crucial element of indirect lighting. What exactly is passive design? So passive design is any kind of architectural design that is primarily based on climatic considerations where we take only that into consideration as the primary factor. We have to make attempts to control comfort that is both heating as well as cooling without any direct consumption of fuels. Using the orientation of the building to control heat gain as well as heat loss. Use the shape of the building that is let it be the plan elevation or the sections to control airflow and using the right kind of materials to control heat gain or heat loss depending on the climate. We need to maximize the use of free solar energy for heating and lighting, maximize the use of free ventilation for cooling, using shade that is either natural or architectural devices to control heat gain. What is the relationship between passive design and sustainability? Passive solar heating and passive ventilation for cooling actually is a tool to achieve, achieve sustainability. Both are all, uh, a passive design is a way sustainability in a design can be achieved. This is basically by reducing dependency of fossil fuels for heating and cooling the buildings. Like we have seen in our previous discussions, we have seen a whopping 30% to 40% of the building uh, consumption of fuels is because of HVAC and the next huge chunk is air lighting. So if both of these can be controlled and one of the tools to control this is utilizing passive design. We can actually reduce the need for electricity to support lighting by using practices of daylighting in buildings. So in lead passive design assists in gaining points in energy and atmosphere category as well as in indoor air quality as passive design promotes natural ventilation and daylighting strategies. So if you look at um, these uh, organizations or these certifications like LEED, they have certain criteria to grade a building. So you have grading points for energy and atmosphere, for site, for indoor air quality, for exterior quality, what kind of trees were cut down. So all of these, this hundreds of criteria that come into the picture. If you use passive design, passive design affects two of the criteria that primarily are affecting the design of the building. That is both the energy and atmosphere category as well as the indoor air quality. However, not all sustainably designed buildings are strongly passive and not all passively designed buildings are by default strongly sustainable although the reverse is most likely this is like how we say a thumb is a finger but not all fingers are thumbs it's similar principle applies over here we have to remember that passive design and sustainability are not synonymous passive design is only a tool or a method by which a sustainable design can be achieved passive buildings require active users so that is the anomaly in the very title itself. Passive buildings, though they are energy efficient and energy sufficient, they require smart users. They require users who are active. So unlike most contemporary design buildings where you just enter, you switch on a light, one switch controls everything, that kind of a building is not considered a well-designed building, nor is it considered a passively designed building. You have to, you, basically the contemporary modern buildings rely on thermostat control to regulate the temperature, relative humidity as well as the temp uh, hum other factors like pressure etc. But passive buildings require 
a direct involvement of the user or the occupant to ensure their success. So, if there, if there are particular lures that need to be lower, lowered, then the particular user who wants to let in the light has to open the lowers or has to shut the lowers depending on the use of the lowers at that point of time in that space. Occupants need to be educated as to when to open the windows and when to shut the windows, raise and lower the shades and otherwise control some of the non-automated means of controlling the effects of the sun, wind on the interior environments of the building. Sometimes passive buildings due to limitations in achieving an interior climate that falls in the middle of the comfort zone will require occupants to accept a wider range of acceptable temperature and relatively humidity values. So that's what basically happens when we were discussing the concept of a comfort zone. A comfort zone for say Mr. X needn't be the same for Mr. Y. But in a passively designed building, this comfort zone has to stretch to accommodate a greater percentage of people. So a greater level of adjustment is required from most of the users. How do you differentiate passive versus active design? So passive design results when a building is created and simply basically works on its own. The plan, section and material selection and siting creates a positive energy flow through the building as well as make sure that energy is saved right from the construction phase to the implementation phase but also during the people uh, during the phase when people are occupying the building and the building is in use but what happens with active design active design uses certain equipment to modify the state of the building create more energy or comfort like pumping water fans air conditioners etc so like we've just discussed passive buildings require active users so this is the three tier approach to passive design if you actually look at the basic tier one you have basic building design which is heat retention heat rejection and heat avoidance what are the things that we usually talk about you have location site design landscaping form orientation, color, insulation, exterior shading, construction of the dif different materials that are used, air tightness. If you look at windows, you need to see the size of the window, the direction the window is placed, what kind of glazing are you going to use, what kind of insulation and shading devices, and efficient lighting as well as efficient appliances. So this is your tier one. Now if you come to tier two, which is your passive systems, you have natural energies which means direct heat gain, trombe wall, sun space, what kind of cooling techniques can you use, comfort ventilation, night flush cooling, earth coupling, the cooling towers and if you think of daylighting, you have light shelves and clear stories. Now finally the third if you look at is the mechanical equipment. How can you reduce the consumption of energy by reducing the number of mechanical equipments that are involved. So if you actually look upon the different uh, levels of mechanical equipment you have for heating, you have for lighting, you have for cooling and by you and definitely some amount of energy is going to be utilized. So how can we channelize that into renewable energy and if it is going to be renewable energy is it going to be solar driven, is it going to be wind turbine driven, what is it going to be driven by. So these details have to be demarcated. And this is the approach how we can go about to designing the passive design of a building. This basically uh, the sustainable design of heating, cooling and lighting is discussed as we have just seen. Tiers 1 and 2 are the basic domains of the architect and proper design decisions of these two levels reduces the energy consumption as much as 80% which is a great percentage when you look at the overall factors. All items which with an asterisk that we have seen are solar responsive design. So when you talk of solar responsive design, how all the sun can be channelized or utilized to achieve maximum output. Importance of solar geometry. Like we have just seen in passive design, most of the elements that we talk about is solar energy driven or can be solar energy driven is the right way to describe it because current scenario we are not utilizing the solar energy to the extent it can be. 
understanding solar geometry will actually help us achieve a better percentage of usage. You know, this you have to do it for passive building design for both heating as well as cooling. Orient buildings properly. Understand seasonal changes that is in the building as well as the surroundings. We need to design shading devices. Use of the sun to animate our architecture. So when you think of sun as an animating part of architecture, and this is the primary examples of this. How they have played with shade and exposure to create patterns in the design. So this is where the challenge of an architect is. Not by creating designs that are difficult to construct, are expensive to construct or high energy consumption designs. And designs can be simple classic lines but by puncturing and creating fenestrations, clear story windows over here, the open uh, space over here, semi open space brings in a lot of daylight. The clear story windows make sure there is daylight but not sunlight and even here there is no direct heat gain. And look at the play of the sunlight here, it creates such lovely images on this huge massive blank wall. And throughout the day as the sun angle changes, these patterns will also change. So it's like getting an ever changing mural in your office space. This is the Perimeter Institute in Waterloo which uses the sun not only to daylight the space but also adds character to the space. So while we are studying solar geometry, we need to figure out how to use the sun's natural path in summer versus winter to provide free heat in the winter but as well as in the summer, you need to reduce the heat gain but in winter it should be providing the, red, the cooling effect should be minimal. So in Canmore Civic Centre in Canmore, this again is an example where you can clearly see there is a contrast between the winter and the summer climates. You can see it in the colour and the materials that have been chosen, the fenestrations, the facade as well as the main thing we should not miss upon is the sun shading devices that we see. The pergolas over here, the sun shading device over here, the recessed window over here and if you look at this design over here, this wall the sun cannot enter directly because there is a wall that is projecting here. These bank of windows again the sunlight cannot enter directly because of the roof structure here. So by creating a depth of spaces, lay a interplay between different types of spaces and openness and shut areas shading devices, landscaping and pergolas, a successful design can be created. Solar geometry works for us because the sun is naturally high in summer making it easy to block the sun with sun shading devices. So you look at, you can look at the sun, how useful the sun shading device is here and it is not even a solid sun shading device made of concrete. It is with a lattice pattern which again creates a beautiful pattern on the wall at the same time prevents direct heat gain into the windows. So this is where the creativity of the architect should come into play rather than this is a challenge we need to take upon rather than blindly imitating designs. And it is naturally low in winter which allows the sun to penetrate below our shading devices and enter the building which means we are basically heating the building for free. So now the sunshade device in Canmore that we saw was at a much greater height. But in winters the sun angle is much lower so it can directly enter into these glazing spaces because of these vast big windows and very well warm up these spaces. Solar transmission through grass, glass. When sun strikes the glass part of the solar radiation is transmitted through the glass and proceeds to heat up the space. But what happens to part of the radiation is it is reflected off the glass and the amount is dependent on the angle of incidence. So the angle at which the sun enters the building will decide what percentage is going to be transmitted and what percentage is going to be reflected. So in summer months when the sun angle is much higher, we need to make sure our glazing is not at a higher level because then the transmission level will be higher than the reflection level. So we need to ensure all of these when we are designing the building. Part of the solar energy is absorbed into the glass then re-radiated both inwards and outwards. When looking to avoid heat entering the building, it is critical to prevent it from this initial transmission through the glass 
as once the heat is in, it is in. Then you do require some kind of mechanical device only to reduce or bring out that heat. So the best way in passive design which works is control the heat that enters the building, control the light that enters the building and then because once something enters the building for you to control it becomes very difficult. So if you look at the solar transmission through varying types of glass, you have the most of the, if you look at the heat gain over here, this is clear glass. Uh, you have about 2% that is re-radiated, 8% that is reflected, but 87% that is transmitted. So most of the incident solar radiation is transmitted and heat gain is quite high. Now if you look at the next type of glass, we have heat absorbing glass. Here 8% is reflected. 12% is re-radiated out, 43% is transmitted and 37% is re-radiated within inside, from inside. So most of the incident solar radiation is either transmitted or re-radiated inside. So the heat gain is relatively lesser. Now the final option which is considered the best option in hot and sunny places is reflective glass where 34% is reflected. 30% is transmitted, but in the percentage that's absorbed, 16% is re-radiated out and 20% is re-radiated. So most of the incident solar radiation is reflected, so there is minimal heat gain. Solar energy is a function of orientation. So over here in this chart, if you look at it, we are demonstrating the variation in solar energy received on different facades and the roof of a building set at a 42 degree latitude. So a horizontal window which is nothing but a skylight receives to more than 4 to 5 times more solar radiation than a south window on June 21st. East and west glazing collects about 3 times the solar radiation of a south window. So a south window is in the dip, north is hardly in a rise. But we have skylights which are taking the maximum followed closely by the windows on the east or west. Now if you look at the solar azimuth range throughout the year, you have a winter solitus, equinoxes and a summer solitus. So since little winter heating can be expected from east and west windows, shading devices on those orientations should be designed purely on basis of summer requirement. because um, the east and west is the primary summer movement of the uh, sun. So east and west when you are looking at we have to concentrate on the summer months, north and south we have to look into the winter months. So that is how we decide what percentage of windows to wall ratio on which facade of the building can work depending on that particular season. Now if you look at the different types of radiation. You have direct radiation, now imagine a person within a building like this and then you have a taller huge concrete building over here again and then you have paving over here. So if I was a person utilizing the space and you have the sun right above on top, you have first some sun hitting the pavement and entering the building that is reflected radiation. Then you have obviously the sun entering through the glazing of that building that is direct radiation. Another form of reflected radiation is instead of the paving surface when the sun hits the nearby concrete building and it enters the window. So we have reflected radiation from two different sources and direct radiation as well. So this is reflective glazing as you can see where it reduces the level of sunlight that is entering the building. Here again we have clear story windows, a simple roof overhang acts as a shading device. So we have discussed the use of a clear story window. Clear story window is given at a top of the room. So number one, direct usage hitting the user is very less. It is diffused radiation, it is not direct radiation. And if you look at the directions here, say this is south and north orientation and the clear story window is right here. You can see that hot air will rise up and it will be able to exit and even if it is permanently closed here in this case it is shut, the shading device will ensure that direct sunlight does not enter 
from this direction and the light that comes from here will be diffused anyways. So, we can control the heat gain of the building by a simple shading device and the placement of a window. Now, how do we go about preventing overheating? Uh, if you look at this is the solar symmetry, our peak of summer is considered June and then we have our March to September is considered the summer or sunny months. You have January to mid March is spring, then you have September to December is fall and winter depending on the place you are. So, if you look at our heating period, it is only overheated period is only from May to October which is a not a big span. So, how do you go about putting those shading devices? So, at that point of time if you have a fixed shading device, say uh, you have a house and you put a fixed shading device like a sunshade. What actually happens when the temperature changes, your shading device is not able to perform well. In the underheated period where Jan, Feb and March you want heat to enter your house, it does not let the heat to enter the house. But in the same scenario, if you have a movable shading device like a awning which can be adjusted depending on the sun angle, you are able to utilize it for a better period of time in a better efficient way. Because if you can extend the shading device here during this transition period right from March or April, then you can control the heat entering your house. Then you can move it more into the overheated period and even into the underheated period say October which actually your permanent device is not able to help, your movable device will definitely help you in preventing your unnecessary heat gain which is definitely considered more efficient. In this case if you see it uses ceramic fritted glass that is sloped to allow some light but also it will help shed rain and wet snow. So, this is a combination where the climate you want where in winters you do want the light to come in, but imagine if it was completely flat in summers it will get in a lot of heat, a lot of heat gain will be there. So, a compromise of this is having it sloped and another added advantage of having it sloped is in the months of monsoon or precipitation in the winters where it is snowfall, it will sledge away and it will keep it clear. So, if now you look at this solid horizontal overhang over here, what happens? you have a snow load that is there directly on it which means you have to take that into consideration and use adequate concrete to make it thicker and this traps hot air next to the building. So, you can see the temperature difference it is not that great. Now, if it is a louvered horizontal overlang this ventilates the hot air and reduces the snow load as well. You can see the temperature difference outside also is relatively more pleasant as compared to the inside. shading strategies for east and west orientations. So, this we need to take a, take a look at it, this is applicable for different places throughout keeping in mind the overall climate may or may not change. So, horizontal overhangs do not work on east and west facades and this is exactly why it does not work. If you look at it the sun only at this period point of time it is in the maximum and in the evening it is maximum if you look at east and west. As the sun rises in the east, it is maximum at that point of time and that time the horizontal device does not serve any purpose. All this morning heat will enter the house. Similarly, in the evening as the sun sets, again the same thing, when it is in maximum as it is set setting, all the heat will enter the house and the horizontal overhang really does not serve any purpose. So, how is, what is the best solution for shading strategies in the east-west elevation? is to limit using east and west windows as much as possible in hot and climates. So, let us keep the fenestrations for the north and south in hot climates. What are the other things that can be done? First thing is you need to avoid windows and if at all you do have windows, how do you do it is to make sure they face north and south. Your windows even though are on east and west can actually face north and south by do uh, uh, aligning the windows like this where you have ambient north light. So, by all these methods if you look at the different solutions over here, all these solutions can be easily integrated with your design, it can be easily adapted, does not require extra investments, it is just a simple thinking pattern. But by doing this, if what happens if you completely avoid windows on the east and west is your daylight is completely shut out 
and what you make up by not bringing in heat you will end up spending by uh, for footing an electricity bill for the lights. So by having this as an awesome solution you have your ambient north light coming in over here which will daylight your space but there is no heat gain. And again over here if you see you have your direct south light which is really good and over here in this kind of a scenario you have both north light as well as south light which will light up the entire room. So if you look at the other ways you can do it is by using vertical fins. Spacing is obviously an issue as well as the fin length but it must be understood that if it has to be effective it will severely restrict the view. So this is a thing we need to go ahead with. There are you know to lose some you have to gain something. So solar penetration is re reduced by moving fins closer and closer and making them deeper or sometimes even both. So in this you can see the exposure angle is greater. Here the exposure angle is much lesser. Now shading strategies for the north elevation. The sun also hits the facade from the northeast and northwest during the summer. So fins can be used to control this oblique light as well. It is the function of the latitude, window size as well as the depth and frequency of the fins. In the sense how close are the fins going to be and how deep are the fins going to be. So this is living awnings which is nothing but trees that you are going to be using as shading devices. Living awnings such as trees and trellises with deciduous vines are very good shading devices. They are in the face with the thermal year gain and lose leaves in response to temperature changes. So this is during fall where there is maximum heat will enter. In summer where it does not enter the room as much as possible. Here you can see the trellis options where other living shade options again it is minimal and multi level if it is say apartment complexes how planter boxes can be used. How do you go about actually reducing these different energy loads using these passive strategies? Again we have a three tiered approach. If you look at the three tiers again over here, first tier is to maximize heat retention. In the sense how can you retain the heat in the building if required. Second passive solar heating, how do you go about using solar energy to heat up the roof? And finally the third for mechanical heating which is nothing but heating devices and other heating elements that are available which consume fuel. So we need to maximize the amount of energy that is required for mechanical heating that comes from the renewable resources. So when you actually look at passive strategies if we concentrate on retention of heat and passive solar heating automatically mechanical heating will take a back seat. So if we actually minimize that factor it will be a very good important thing for us to do towards achieving passive design towards passive heating. How do you go about heating a building in a passive way? So now we have seen how passive design plays an active role in sustainability and to achieve a suitably sustainable design. That brings us to the end of this module. Thank you.